Commence primary ignition. I'm just not the, the hero type, clearly. What a piece of junk. Enterprise, this is the captain. I got a bad feeling about this. It's all part of the plan. Engage. Welcome back to Podcast 2 for 1. I'm your host, Donovan Thompson, with my co-host, Daniel Wingfield. And today is episode 96 on the road to episode 100. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, that notification bell. That way you're up to date on all future episodes of Podcast 2 for 1, as well as all the cool content at 2 for 1 Studios. And please subscribe and like the channel at youtube.com slash 2 for 1 Studios, the best place to consume the content. And if you didn't know, and I'm sure you didn't, we are sponsored by Kapow Comics. Located at 4047 East Kill Avenue in Sherwood, Arkansas. There they have comic books, collectibles, graphic novels, and of course, special guest appearances throughout the year. I was there yesterday, and they have some really cool stuff, especially for Christmas time. Go check them out. And um, some really expensive shit, like really cool rare stuff. I was like, holy crap, they have this. It's, it's there. Go check them out. 4047 East Kill Avenue. Kapow. And today, Daniel, we are talking Eternals. Mm. Yes, we are. Mm-hmm. Yes, we are. Um, I had seen it already once beforehand, and yes. you and me went together for, for your first, my second time. Mm. And, you know, this movie was announced a couple years back. It's some Disney investor thing. Um, you know, whenever it was announced, I was kind of like, okay, I don't give a flying fuck about this movie. And I was like, I'm going to watch it. It's Marvel. You know, Chloe's out. It's fine. Whatever. Great. Um, the trailer drops. I'm like, okay, it looks different. It looks pretty. It looks like they're trying to be different. I'm still not just like a wild by it. I'm not like blown away by it because it's not anybody I care about. But we do have my boy Dane Whitman in there, played by Kit Harrington, which we'll get to in a little bit. So that was kind of cool. But then the movie came out. Mm. And you know, I went and saw it at the IMAX, which I normally don't do, um, but I went to the IMAX this time to watch it, and I enjoyed it. You know, I mean, I can sit here and, and, and really pick apart a lot of pieces of it, but overall, I like at least the journey. I like just hanging out with the characters. Um, I know we're going to get into to some plot devices and choices and that kind of stuff, which, again, not perfect, but I liked it. And I think what I it felt like to me more like a stepping stone for bigger things. Like, okay, mm-hmm. the chess mm-hmm. pieces are moving together because I can see all the connective dots. And that was fun for yeah. me. And I think because my expectations were so low, like I just didn't care, <laughs> then it's fine. And I like it. But if it was like Spider Man and like it was, you know, my expectations are up here and they didn't meet it, it'd be much, it'd be a different situation. But it wasn't. Sure. So I liked it. Tell me your thoughts on it. Yeah, so just coming into it for me, I was right there with you, not really having any connection to any of these characters. Uh, liked, I liked a lot of the actors that were in it, and I think a lot of the performances were good. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I would say I had medium expectations. I wasn't expecting it to be Thor the Dark World, but I wasn't expecting it to uh, be anywhere close maybe to like the top crop, like maybe the top five, top ten of Marvel movies. Um, <clears throat> mm-hmm. And I'll say I, I mean, it It was enjoyable at times. I think there were some interesting things that they did. There were some interesting, um, like you said, chess pieces that were moved around for future things. But to me, I think that that's where I come down to in it. I think that's mm-hmm. to me a big, um, it speaks to the movie and I, what I think, the, how the quality effect or how I connected to it that to me the most interesting things apart about this movie had nothing to do with this movie or what happened sure. in it. It had to do with what it's setting up or the characters it's introducing or just kind of that um, hmm, taking another step forward in this like cinematic plot. I think we've talked about it. I don't know how much we've talked about it on the plot pod, uh, but you know, at this point we're so invested. We're a fans of the universe as much or more than we are individual films. And I think to us, the big movies we're interested in and really looking forward to like Spider-Man No Way Home are these movies that are moving the plot of the MCU as a whole forward rather than just like these character maybe uh, steps forward for individual characters. Um, And so I think that even says like, I feel like I was maybe getting more out of this than maybe just your average movie viewer. 
But yeah, I would say it was, um, I think it, it, this is a challenging film. I think there's a lot of things that it tries that I don't think it lands very well. I think um, that some of the choices that felt like maybe they were done to be different or to try to present a different version of an origin story or an origin film just didn't come off. Uh, like I, I like where their head was at maybe when they were trying to do that, trying to, to make it stand out, but I don't feel like it really came together. And as a movie, as like a standalone film, I think it's pretty rough. Uh, Story-wise, character-wise, when you get into character motivations and goals and you know, you know who are we aligned with, what's going on, I think that's all, it's a pretty jumbled mess. And so I understand, I think, a lot of the negative reviews or just the, um, you know, less than stellar reception for sure. Yeah. And, you know, all that's valid. And I, I can't really argue too much against m most of it. But no, you can't I, here's the thing. I'm always, I don't right. I'm always right. <laughs> but I don't think the movie is warranted of 43% on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, but, but not but when Rotten Tomatoes, though, I think is not a good metric for this because that just means that like, 43 or you know 60 percent of people had like thought it was a uh what like a six out of ten or a seven out of, like it was a less than it was a it was a not positive review it wasn't a fresh review i think if you like look at more places like like imdb i think is a is a safer let's see sure let's go see, for wanna, it let's just look what's, what's let's, let's compare Let's compare it on there and Thor the Dark World. I'll look at Thor the Dark World. Do you 6. look at 6.9 on inter on IMDb. I think that's a much more fair 6.9 out of 10, not quite even a 7, which I would say like a 6 is good, a 7 is great, you know, maybe so it's not it's it's good, it's not great. Oh. Um and well, I think to that's be fair a, here, Thor 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 the Dark World is 6.8. <laughs> right. So it's right <laughs> so above Thor, Thor Dark World. Yeah, I just think Maybe I get it. And Rotten Tomatoes is a fun, like, it's a fun thing to just check. And honestly, it's more of a marketing tool these days than it is anything else because I think people yeah, have like, kind right. of trusted it as this source of, of, of like, what does Rotten Tomatoes say? Is it good or bad? But um, the way they rate, yeah. the way they tally those is really, it, it's, it's not the most accurate or the most, I think, um, representative of true thoughts. I think a 6.9 out of 10 is pretty accurate. I might rate it like a 6.5 sure. personally. Sure. I, I mean, that's, I can, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, let's kind of get into the plot of this. And it's pretty straightforward for the most part, kind of. <laughs> so we understand that, this, that the universe was created by Celestials. And in this case, um, the prime Celestial Arisham. And he creates, um, we'll kind of, we won't go through the plot or like do the, the twist sure. of it. We'll just kind of say what actually happens. So he creates the Deviants. Um, to basically um, stop or help life be created on planets so other celestials can be born. Were they always called deviants? Yes. Surely they had a better name first because like deviants is like they did I'm, wrong. So surely there was like... I'm sure I'm sure they were named what, later. Wait, what was the name in the in Loki? It wasn't deviants? Variants. Variants. This is getting too many ints around here. You know what I mean? We're, yeah, too many Are they deviants? Are so they the variants? Deviants, yeah. What about variant deviants? So the deviants, that, they actually probably exist. I know. Um, the deviants, so the deviants are um, creatures to basically help life flourish, but they instead start attacking sentient life, which stops the, the birth of celestial who are planted inside different planets. Of course, there's one planet on Earth. And then and since that's happening, he, um, Arisham also creates the Eternals to go in and basically take care of the deviants and to also protect the planet only from deviants. So life can be born. Um, which is kind of interesting because you start is, thinking yeah. about that. Like, well, why wouldn't you protect against all things that way you could just, well, actually I have an idea. I just thought of an idea okay. plot hole. So it's yeah, essentially um, you have these, um, some Eternals come to Earth 5,000 years ago. They show up. They kind of help um, advance civilization on the human level to a small extent. Of course, it starts leading to war and all these other kind of things like World War I, World War II. And the Eternals eventually disband over a few agreements, and we catch up with them in modern-day times. The Deviants are mm -hmm. back, and there's kind of like a... The whole movie is really essentially like getting the band back together, and it's just like... Two Eternals go find the third. Those three find the fourth. And they're going constantly, constantly, constantly until they find out, hey, 
there's the big kind of crux of the movie. Eventually, our purpose is to let this other new eternal um, Tiamat be born. It's going to destroy Earth, but in but doing so will create potentially billions and billions of other planets. So it's like we kill the few to, to create the many. Sure. The Eternals all don't agree with this. It turns out Icarus is the one that's kind of been pushing things along. He kind of agrees with Arisham the most. He kills their original leader, Ajax. And it turns out ultimately they stop TM up from being born. Mm-hmm. And at the very end of the movie, which is interesting, Arisham takes the Eternals for betraying him and say, we're going to judge the planet. And we kind of lift on a cliffhanger. That's a b- bare bones version of the plot. Mm-hmm. But let's kind of t- get into like in terms of what worked for you and what didn't work for you mm. and why. Uh, well, I would say just first off the bat, just when you read through it, when you go over it like that, to me, that jumps out is just the structure to me was just all over the place. Uh, we had a lot of jumps forward. We go from modern day to, you know, pat- to the past, to ancient times. They were in Babylon. It was an ancient city they were they dealt a lot with, mm-hmm. which was pretty. I like the visuals there and stuff like that. That was cool. Um, but yeah, I think for me, just the plot of like kind of slowly getting the gang back together, but in this way that felt, um, I don't know, it felt almost lackadaisical, maybe not in terms of like character motivation, but just in terms of like how it felt shot or how it felt pieced together. It just yeah. didn't feel like it, anyone was in too much of a rush, which felt just slightly odd. Um, and I'll just say too, it just, so Cersei, uh, Gim, Gemma, Sean, Chan, Gemma, Shim, Gemma, I don't know how to say her first name, Gemma or Gemma. I think it's Gemma um, Chan. Gemma Chan, excuse me. Um, she was kind of positioned not by anything in the story, but basically by like kind of just who we followed the most as the main protagonist, right? We started with her. It kind of revolved around her and Icarus's relationship, at least slightly at times. And then, you know, she kind of had the final moment too. Um, and to me, and this is true of all of the characters, but especially I think it's egregious because we're following her so much. I have no personal connection to any of these people. Like, I understand that they were given a mission and that at some point they like fell in love with earthlings and then they want to protect them. But I don't feel like I was given any like in internal personal reasoning for that. Like, and I think this even extends to like Icarus, right? Like, so Icarus doesn't want to abandon the mission. Why? Because he's an eternal and he thinks they should keep doing it. But, but why did he not abandon it when all these people did abandon it? Like, did they get more attached to the humans than he did? And if so, why weren't we given like scenes to illustrate that and show that like, oh, like, Oh, they're getting really attached to these people. And Icarus is still like, oh, well, it's just a mission. It's just a job kind of thing. Like any, even just little things like that would have at least given me like, oh, I'm understanding why this character won't give up the mission. Or like, I, I don't know. I just felt like I just wasn't given. I, I had a lot of plot motivation. I don't feel like I had very much character motivation in this film. Or if there was, it just was very um shallow or just not not it was very external motivation and not lots of internal motivations for me at all and so i think that is to where i well, get to the end of the movie real quick and I'm like sorry go ahead no i was go gonna ahead. say i think the reason why they didn't do that and it's a bad reason why is because it would have put the it would have showed their hand that icarus is a is the bad guy and then i think that you're right i think it would have done the story some service and I think that it's a within the first five minutes, you already know he's the bad guy. So the, the I mean, twist is not especially good if you enough. watch the trailers. Just, the twist is not. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I was talking to you, I think months ago, maybe when the first trailers came out, like over a year ago, um, I was reading in the comments and it wasn't like, oh, leaks. It was just kind of like, hey, it's kind of weird how they cut this trailer, how Icarus is only in these scenes or we don't we don't seem to see him here doing this. And like, and I was like, yeah, I feel like he's probably the bad guy. Like it just you just got that sense from the character. Um, yeah, yeah. especially, especially because we didn't really have any clear bad guy antagonist. We had that one moment with like, um, I, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's Angelina Jolie's Thena character speaking to this deviant in a cave, but it was just so like, mm-hmm. and that was in the trailer, but we never got a name for him. He was never like shown as a real villain. He just kind of seemed as a nobody at that. That was, it was even worse in the full movie when we get to him. But yeah, I yeah. just felt like the twist yeah, of Icarus. 
Crow. I would never there have known go. that. Ever have known that without looking at sure. the credits. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but just the twist that Icarus is bad is not good enough to sacrifice these interpersonal motivations. It does not work. Um, and I, that's I was gonna, what I was saying is I get to the end of this movie and I care more about John uh, Kit Harrington's Black Knight, who's in probably literally 10 minutes of runtime, maybe if 15, that. maybe less. I care more yeah, about him than I do about any Eternal. And I just spent a whole yeah, me too. with him. And that is that is a glaring problem. <laughs> and I think that yeah. like that's just like backing up to like let's stop talking about MCU or this is just a a a, a movie problem that I think any movie would have if this is how they handled it, whether it's an ensemble or not. Um, and so I think that's just, and to me, I think, you know, character, feeling close to characters, connecting with characters and and feeling the plot service that, that to me is what makes the best movies and even Marvel movies, you know? And I think because that lacked, because that was to me the biggest glaring hole in this film, it just really, really underperformed for me and just, I just didn't connect with it. And if I'm not emotionally connecting with the film or the characters or the plot, it's like, well, that was good plot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, well, yeah, go ahead. No, well, I think, no, I think you're right. I don't think you're wrong at all. And I think my big thing is that again, I'm going to touch back to us from the beginning is that it's just, you know, it's, I, I had fun watching it. You know, I'm not like yeah. super invested. Yeah. What wasn't, I'm still not. But I think you're right. I think a few things to kind of piggyback what you said off. I think the transitions between modern day to some of the flashbacks, they're not they're not very well done in no. terms of like they don't really immediately say, hey, we're in a different time period. Sometimes it is because like it's architecture and like nighttime or flames or something like that. But a lot of times it's not. And also the flashback sequences, we kind of discussed this a little bit after watching it was that they're not radically different. Like, I think it'd have been cool maybe to go extreme with it and like had them in the, like the tunnels of war, world war one mm, or world war two, mm -hmm. with yeah. like people with hats on in America. And then you have like the Romans and you have them in gladiator yes. stuff, you know, like, like big world kind of lean into that. Like I would yeah. love to have seen them at like the, the dropping of the, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Like what were they doing yeah. at that point or, or things well, you like did that on that one? You did, oh, did see I, that. That's why I'm thinking of that then, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I, that I was, was like, oh yeah, should, yeah, oh yeah, that's why that's why I'm thinking they should do that because they did it. But <laughs> what was bad about it is that you see the you see the aftermath of it and it's like a small two minute sequence and then it's immediately yes. he's fine again because he's fine again because like he's now in modern time we lost three a couple yeah. like a hundred years basically worth the character development that's right because it was only um, it was only there for for fastos's character right it was just kind of showing his yeah, like only disillusionment there. Yes, with humans. Yeah. Humanity. And the thing I have a problem with this movie, and it's it's almost a universe problem. It's really bad in the DCEU, but I think it's starting to become an issue in the Marvel Studios movie because they're getting so big, the, or the universe is getting so big and there's so many characters, is that I like it when we see how we as people not super react to the superheroes. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. like, uh Ju justice league it's even snyder cut or whatever version the whedon version snyder cut mm -hmm. one of its biggest fault is that it's the team doing stuff remotely when no one's yes. watching them do yes it. there's no reaction and yeah. avengers avengers didn't have that it literally has them the most, in new york yeah. saving saving people and then it's like also the the high government is involved the the people on the grounds involved and then more importantly there's a whole sequence like the world is like now aware of the Avengers. Yeah, it feels a real. It feels like there's a real world because we're seeing reactivity in ways exactly. that we would expect reactivity in real life. We would expect governments to be on the phone and about to launch nukes. You know, be like, we're sacrificing New right. York to save the world. Like that feels believable for sure. Um, no, I agree, and, and I think like and then, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say going back to the, what you mentioned earlier, it reminded me. You know how we're bouncing back and. About, you know, we're, we're in present day and then we're past, we're present day and we're past. And the problem is that they do with that is because in present day, we're having this urgent problem. The deviants are back. We don't know what's going on. We got to get everybody together. And then we're like, okay, great, let's go do it. And then we jump to the past and it's like the urgency is gone. And it, what it reminded me of just now as you were explaining that was it reminded me of that episode, those, uh, I think it's season two or three of Stranger Things. It's almost Sean Astin, it may be two. 
it's the one where like it's like end of the season and we're like everything's coming to a head and like they're about to like show down with these monsters and it's like the the the, the final like image of this episode is like oh shit what's going to happen next and then the next episode is this weird ass punk rock episode with 11 where she goes to some detroit place and has this weird 80s moment <laughs> with like punk rock hair and shit and it's like the urgency is just sucked from the show and you come back to that next episode after that where they're actually dealing with the cliffhanger they set up before and you're just like the momentum you had going is gone like i'm still invested but like i feel like i was like <laughs> i feel like i was teased and and you know and you just then that's all it was and like you just left this huge gap and that now that, that i'm i'm kind of lost within the urgency of the narrative and i feel like this movie does that over and over again and that to me is like the big issue with like the pacing of like you're telling me this is a problem and this is urgent but in the way you're showing me this film it doesn't feel that way and, and that just felt right. inconsistent no i think i think you're right i think it, it does kind of hinder it a little bit and on top of that um we don't really get a whole lot of why cersei and icarus are in love and so whenever they're apart they, they came out of the pods impactful. at the same time i don't know they were both looking at earth at the same time <laughs> like like that's yeah. they showed that scene like twice and it was supposed to be this like oh it's beautiful and he's like you are a beautiful or something like that's not <laughs> it's not in depth right. at all it's like two lines it's, yeah. Like I'm more invested in obviously Dane, Dane and Cersei's relationship <laughs> and Icarus and Cersei because he feels human and he feels like he's trying to connect to her. They're doing human things together. Yes. Yes. Like, you know, it feels real. And he also, he's, let's just take it one second. Dane Whitman, he feels so likable. Oh yeah. And like a good character. He feels like a true successor in spirit to the Chris Evans, Captain America. Now this is not a slight on, um, our new cat, black cat. I'm blanking out. Uh, Anthony, no, what's his name? Uh, I was hoping you say Anthony Blackie. I was like, no, Daniel, no, it's Anthony Mackie. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's Anthony Mackie. Yeah, no, no, Anthony <laughs> Mackie. Sorry, that would have been bad. If I'd said that. No, it this is no been. slide to him. I, I thought think you were going Anthony, that way. I think, I think one of the beautiful things about Anthony Mackie's cap is that he's different. That he feels more like he's almost this cap that's more concerned with injustice and like righting wrongs, whereas like. I feel like Chris Evans' cap was like about preserving the good. And I think both are great in their own ways. But I feel like Kit Harrington feels like that. Like, in, he's, like, he can deliver lines, I think, the way Chris Evans delivered lines. That is, it's not that Ma Mackie's worse. He just, I would give Mackie different lines to deliver than I would give Chris Evans if I was writing the characters, right? I just think they, they, their strengths lend to different types of emotion and different types of dialogue. But to me, Kit Harrington feels like, oh, but I could write cap lines that Kit Harrington could say, and it feels just as good. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and well, he has a like, and Sam Wilson's great, like in all fronts. But fantastic. He, he he. It's not that he's lacking this, but Kit Harrington and Chris Evans, they have this like when they speak their lines, this sincerity with it. It feels like it's like not, it's not maybe that's not the right word, genuine, but it's it feels no, like it feels it's, pure. It feels like, like they have like these pure yeah, hearts. Pure. They have these like. They're not tainted by the darkness of the world for better and worse. And I think that obviously like they did a lot with Cap that he like came from this idyllic version of American society when he went under and like everything is like America's great. Everything's OK here. And then he gets out and it's like, oh, but not really anymore. And, and that, that contrast is what works. And obviously they played on that more with Mackie's character who has been around for all the, the bullshit of America, right? Like he's lived through the yeah. bullshit. And so he comes from a different perspective. But I agree, Kit Harrington feels like this kind of pure of heart character. And I think what's great about those characters is that you can just do so much with them, I think, because yeah. you don't leave them there, right? Like like Cap did not stay, I mean, he's cussing by the end of Endgame or whatever, you know, and that's like a minor thing, but that's just like a, a small representation of like, this isn't the cap that woke up out of the ice. This cap's seen some shit and been through some shit. And he's had to fight through the darkness to get where he is now. And I think that's just a really fun journey to put characters on. And I think works really great in, in superhero yeah. media. And so I agree. No, I think you're 100% right. And let's let's shelve Kit Harrington for a second because uh -huh. I want to talk about him at the end. Sorry, Kit. With the, with, yeah, this yeah. first for a second. Um, let's talk about um, this idea of the 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 celestials creating more celestials to create more life um it seems on the surface 
that it's kind of a like a benevolent godlike thing like you're creating something and you are going to destroy something but you are creating something infinitely more almost right billions of other planets with more life on it you kind of wonder i wonder why do you do this like what's the point of this like why do you enjoy this i mean coming from my own religiously saturated background kind of where i see it is that like i I wouldn't necessarily read it as benevolence as more of like this is just what they do this is what this is what um what i'm blanking on the names celestials do this is their nature they reproduce almost they're they're almost just like humans they just reproduce differently right like their goal is to live and to create and to reproduce. And so I just kind of read it as more like this is just the universe and how it works more than like, oh, there are these loving or not loving things. I'm not even sure if they're evil or bad. I, they they kind of seem neutral to me. And I will say I did enjoy kind of this movie getting into some like creationism or like some creation mythos in the Marvel universe of like how did the universe come to exist? Uh, I, I hope that they delve more into that. And I assume that they might just based on like us dealing with time and multiverses, like at what point did the, does the universes start splitting off from each other? Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like the Celestials, they're really interesting. And I would say they're also a part of this movie that I found like, I, the, the, the Celestials more interesting than the Eternals to me. And that that's another indictment, of, I think, of the movie. But like, I really thought the the celestials were cool and visually stunning, and I just, I'm 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 assuming that he, you know, um, what's it, the the main celestial that they were dealing with will come back. I mean, obviously he's going to judge the Earth, and to me, judging the Earth feels like that's a that's an Avengers movie, right? Whenever he comes to judge the Earth or whatever happens there, that feels like a team up. That doesn't feel like just Eternals. Um, and I'm well, it feels like Galactus. That. Yeah, right. Yeah, it feels, it feels like. like yeah, it feels like it's going to yeah. be a, a, a Avengers level threat, basically, saying that this isn't yeah. just going to be a solo film kind of plot. Um, well, what I'm saying is, like, I, I think they can almost retcon Galactus a little bit and make him like the the hand or something of Arisham. Like, he's got to come down and destroy Earth. Is Galactus um, or whatever? He's not yet. I'm, so I'm he's saying in, this, he this was in the Fantastic Four, like, Silver Surfer. That's where he was. Yes. So this to me feels like this could be like the, the, the paving the way towards that conflict. Like you just oh, wreck yeah. him as a celestial. He's Arishams, whatever. He go down, kill this planet for sure. Whatever. Well, I almost wonder and if like judge yeah. is going to be like this. Like to me, it almost seems like uh, it reminds me of like some of those old Spider-Man cartoon, like Madam web type shit, but like maybe even before it's like when he's like, there's one, I think it is a Madam Web, where he's like t- told to put together a team to like pass this test or whatever. And there's one where he puts together like a team of like all superheroes. And there's another one where he puts like a team of like just Spider-Man from different dimensions. And more thinking like the first one where he's putting together, he, I think he gets like the Fantastic Four and like all these different superheroes to help him out. And to me, that I, that's kind of where I was thinking this might go is like Galactus or or the other guy, Irishim, shows up and is like, show me what you got basically rick and morty like show me what you got but instead of a dance contest well you know what that is it's then. superhero contest well what you well wait, i'm glad you said that what yeah. you're explaining first of all the spider-man team up in the animated series was the last yes. two episodes where it was the yeah, series finale the, the one before that is what i'm thinking yes the one before that was secret wars okay they did that in animated basically in the animated yeah, spider-man yeah. okay that's how i, that's I didn't realize how I get that was the, that's like it's the black suit that's like cool. it's the black suit. So, so anyway, that's a that's the thing where I can't remember who it was. Um, Secret Wars, it's some guy like Bean or something. It may I can't remember who it was. Maybe it's the, I think it's the Watcher. It's somebody. But they go in yeah. and basically get all the heroes, pluck them on a place called Battle World, and say yes. duke it out. Yes, like that. That is more what I'm thinking is like a judgment. It's not going to be like I'm going to kill you now, defend yourself. It's going to be like your best against my best, and if you can prove your worthiness. I let your planet live that that's, and that's just me reading uh, from just my own perspective, what that sounded like to me. Maybe we're sure. not getting that specifically, but that also sounds better. We, we've got to find a way to not just do, we're going to come destroy the universe or the world again. You know, we've got to find a way to kind of vary up the threat and make it not just we win or everyone dies. Cause I think, you know, we've done that a lot now. And so we need just to find some, some ways to spice that up a bit. And that sounds like a way they could potentially do that. Um, 
I do want to talk a little bit about like Icarus, the final sure. battle, fighting Crow. Yes, we need to. <laughs> yes, let's just talk about Crow, right? Basically, sure. um, he was a, he was a he was a, a red herring character. It was he like was. He was. it was like, hey, this guy's bad. Did I, I'm trying to remember? Did they ever even? What was it? They, they like got frozen in ice and they melted eventually. Was that the whole like reason that they were still around? Is that right? Yeah, that, that's and and uh, he discovers them and he pushes Ajax into there into the bottom. Then he's right. they kill her and take over right. her powers, and that's how right. Crow is started to be born. Yeah, right. Yeah, that character was just useless and pointless, and like the only reason that they uh, that character existed was to throw you off the scent for Icarus. It's the only reason, and they deal with him so quickly, <laughs> like they just. Like uh, uh, Athena, I think just like slices Athena. him in half a couple times, and it just and like building up this moment where they had like so many characters had a problem fighting him, or like it was hard for them, and then she just kind of he's like sucking her powers out, and then she's just like nope, and slices him, and it was just like oh mm -hmm. that was easy, yeah he just felt useless, and so just it just like made you like just don't don't even include him, like find like that's where you just like we, at this point we should have gone back to the writing the the, the writing room and been like. This isn't good. We need to figure out what we're doing story wise, so we're not having to like throw this plot device character in here that just in the mm -hmm. end feels just so dissatisfying. You know, like there was no satisfaction. Well, I he think. Died. Well, Matt said this when we after get we watched the first time, and I I agree with him. I think that he would have been more a more interesting villain. Like he was the forgotten child, and. Yes, you know, he, and he, he actually kind of follow him. Yeah. And what was the most I mean. interesting thing about him was when he was actually talking, he was like, he was like, you know what? We weren't always deviants. We were the Eternals basically before the Eternals. Like we were the good guys first. And then he turned against us. Like, I want to know the details of that. Like make revolve exactly. the story about being like, oh, well, actually, you know, Eternals are just tools. He has no, no care for you at all. You're just tools and, you know, he will dispose of you when he's done with you and make that the reason why these guys decide to ultimately take a stand against him. And, you know, and then sprinkle in these, you know, organic, you know, character driven reasons why Icarus can't do that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Icarus was on a team a long time ago and that team did the same thing and he saw them kill him. Like he saw um, Arishim just wipe out his whole team and he like loved those people. And he's like, no, I don't want to see my friends killed again from like going against Arishem. And he feels like the only way to do that is to like kill them. And like, make it this like interesting, like he actually is thinking he's loving them through doing this. He actually thinks he's helping by trying to force them to obey Arishem. And that is so much more interesting than what they did with it. Like, because you could still make him the ultimate bad guy, but make him believable, make you almost like, sympathize with him for what he's doing rather than just being like he sounds like he's just like a workaholic right he's like well nothing but work and if we don't have work what are we we're nothing you know if if we don't have a job to do what the fuck is our point and it's like right come on man like no you're right i don't know well let's talk a little bit about the eternals creation and stuff so it sounds like yeah. they are like almost like synthetic beings more like androids but like they're sentient and potentially have souls. We would we would suspect so that's why they're not snapped, which I find kind of hard to believe. Which makes me wonder also why aren't yeah. the celestials snapped away? Um, yeah, that definitely felt was, like that felt like a throwaway yeah. explanation, not actually like deep world building lore to me. To me, you know what I mean? That they weren't about the snap part. The, the, the whole like, oh yeah, well they just don't have souls or something. But it feels like. It almost feels like you're you're opening up a box that feels like has to be dealt with at some point. Like, do senti like how do we define a soul <laughs> or in the MCU? What is a being? What is life? Right. That feels like it could be its whole other like this whole other like giant phase of plot. Um, but yeah, it, it felt a little throwaway to me, and I think that's the problem with this movie a lot. It felt like they just had to figure out ways to justify things rather than building a story within the universe that felt organic. You know what I mean? No, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. And it, it, it gets complicated because then you start wondering like, okay, is Ultron, if there was a snap from Ultron, like a snap, but Ultron still 
Um, yeah. You know. Well, based on um, Thanos' sorry, Katie's, thesis. Sorry, Katie's texting me. I'm sorry. Oh, fine. I get it. Based <laughs> on Thanos, call me. the reason uh, Thanos is doing this because there's not enough resources in the universe. And Ultron really only needs electricity, which is infinitely generatable. So I feel like he might be like, uh, you know, <laughs> he might be saved just on a technicality that he doesn't eat food or drink water. Uh, but uh, and I also feel like the Celestials, to me, they just seem like they like exist above like the Infinity Stones in terms of like power or like dimensional existence. Well, it says in the opening, it says they are created before the six singularities, which is the, which Infinity, is the Infinity Stones. Stones. Yeah. So I would assume that they just aren't affected by their power. Almost like the fucking TVA kind of shit, where they like sure. they're just there's rocks to them basically, based on how much it does make you have. wonder. Like if if the Celestials, it seems like they're 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 bound to this universe, correct? But they're not. They're, we don't know they're hot no universes. So it's so it seems like they're in this hierarchy of universe, and then we have the multiverse. So maybe right. some maybe some multiverses weren't created by Celestials. Maybe they were. Maybe. I mean, it's obviously it's infinite, but it's you wonder like who yeah. created the multiverse then? But I also you feel like, like that's they're bigger, just, right? Right. I do feel like they must live in some kind of alternate dimension because like they're bigger than planets, like giant. And like if they're that right. big and all over, then you should be able to see them like anywhere, <laughs> like in the in space. Like, oh yeah, there's the celestial, like just chilling out in his recliner over there, like that's the big dipper. You know what I mean? I do suspect that there's not that many celestials though. No, you know but even one, if he's like the size of like a small galaxy, then like he should be like seeable from any telescope on earth kind of thing. Like there should be more visible than like, Mars. Literally creating, I mean, they were creating whole galaxies. It seems yeah, in his hand. Big. So like, yeah. I, I feel like they must live in like some like other dimension or like they only reveal themselves when they want to or something. I assume. Yeah. One, one last thing before I get into a few more things. Um, sure. <laughs> so we, it really feels like the sequel of Eternals would be a, we're, we're kind of splitting the group, right? So a couple of them are with uh, Irish Gem to be judged. And then a couple of them um, are picked up with the after credit sequence where we see Eros, who is the Star Fox, um, the brother. Yeah. Star Fox, who is the brother of Thanos, which I guess Thanos has a deviant gene, which makes him purple. Didn't know that. This is so, so this is getting into confusing shit, to be honest. I'm like, yeah. They, yeah. The brother of Thanos. That was weird. Also, Thanos is much bigger than this guy. Uh, like yeah. Unless he's bigger. like hiding his true form, like Loki or something. Sure. That, that, that I could see that actually, that might be a good ex explanation, but it seems like the big thing might be, they're going to get their memories, right? They have tons of memories stored away from Airstream because they've yes. been doing this on a loop for who, who knows how long since the dawn of the terminals. So, um, and, and I guess he is also an eternal star Fox is. Sure. I feel like Which at this point, we're wonder, just going to start labeling people eternals and it's going to lose its meaning. <laughs> well, here, well I just thought of something. So if, if Thanos is part, well, I guess maybe because he's part deviant, part eternal. So I was like, how so do he all, get And all away? Titans are part deviant, part total, total, whatever. Like, that's just what Titan the race I is. I don't know. It's like an Eternal and a Deviant got it on and made Titans, and now it's a, it's a whole species. It might be because you would think that, like, the Eternals wouldn't. How could they, like, leave and go, like, on their own agency without Erishem? I guess some of them are, are on their own because Erishem didn't get the other three. It starts kind of getting kind of plot confusing a little bit. It does. And I feel like that is a. Term for me, and maybe they will explain all this in like the most satisfying level of detail in the future, but I don't have a lot of hope for that. And I think for me, it feels like this movie just feels clunky in that in trying to use so many things that almost as like plot devices to like get around things narratively or logically, it feels like you're like bull in a china shop suddenly like starting to break these other, like again, like the whole like celestials as like i guess the god like the true gods of the mcu seem to be celestials in terms of like they created everything um and then like like i was talking about with like um Ooh. well real quick ahead. what's interesting is that egos in, in gardens of the galaxy volume two he says and i guess he was formed however way but he yeah. says i'm a celestial and you know peter you're half celestial and he said and he goes right. you're like god and he goes small you know small g son 
So right, because he's like a, he he's a minor like a smaller, celestial. He's not a. So. He doesn't. He doesn't. He's 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 only a smaller. Pl- he's not a huge planet. He's a smaller planet. Yeah, he's I literally mean, like a brain with like a planet around. Yeah, it, he's yeah. not a. Yeah, no, exactly. So that feels. But he's almost exactly doing the same thing with like planting seeds on all these different planets. Hundred. Yeah. As soon as I saw that, I was like, "Whoa, that's what Ego's doing." And that's, yeah. that's exactly what Ego's doing. Right. So, yeah, it just feels like again, it feels like it was a bit clunky. This feels like a clunky entry into the universe, and it feels like it's bumping up against these other ideas that almost deserve their own time and space to deal with. You know what I'm saying? It feels like it's opening all these containers of like. Oh, but what about this now? But what about this now? But how's this work now? What, 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 how does, you know, like it just, and it feels like, yeah, I hope they it's are too able deep to sci-fi. address everything in a way that doesn't, what you don't want is you don't want all these lore and like world building things just to become plot devices that don't have their own space to like exist and like be explored in, in, in a movie or in some kind of narrative. And that feels like we're, we're, this movie felt like it was kind of doing that. And I hope that it is not the start of a trend. In the MC. I agree because again, the the deeper it, it always a problem with like high concept sci fi stuff. Yes, it starts getting a little unruly, and very little times does it is it done correctly. No, I mean it's it's very true, and I think there's lots of examples. I mean, I think the Dune series is a great example. Like those first two books, people say are amazing, and then everyone says like it gets horrible after that, right? Like sometimes like. You come up with a brilliant idea, but if you try to explore it to its farthest reaches, you start running into like literal logic issues that are almost like if we knew how to make this work in a movie, we'd know how to make it work in real life almost kind of thing. Like, how do you explain Mm -hmm. this with that? And so I I do feel like we're getting into some delicate territory right now uh, with all these multiverses, with time being this giant factor uh, with Kang and everything. Um, I think they have a they have a much bigger job to do than they did in the Infinity Saga for me right now. I feel like they have a lot more threads. They have a lot more it's just a more complicated story. And yeah. they're going to have they're going to have to do a better job with this to make it feel as good as Infinity War and Endgame and that whole saga. They're, they have more work to do to even reach that level than they had with those first movies. And I think part of that is inevitable with like, you have to follow up your magnum opus basically with this magnum opus number two, I guess. Um, but yeah. it does feel like just, just based on the story they're telling, they've got a lot more to do to make it work than they did in, in the Infinity yeah. Saga. No, I agree with you. It's a tall. It was a tall order. As soon as end game credits ended, like yeah, it was like how, how are they going to top this? Like we have ascended kind of thing. And so far, like Shang Chi's good. The TV shows are good. Black Widow's fine. Sure. Um, you know, the Eternals was like their first kind of flop in terms of like wasn't a critical like it wasn't you know like just yeah. I mean, it was I, it more feels mixed like- or negative than good. And the dark Thor the Dark World was that too, I think. And to be fair, that happened pretty early in the series and they learned from it, I think. So I, I hope that they will take some lessons from this as well. Um Yeah. I'm not I'm not I'm I not think they will. I'm not like disparate or like worried necessarily about the MCU. And I think part of that too is because I'm so bought in at this point. I now have nostalgia for the MCU, right? Like I've been watching the MCU for 14, 13 years or something like now by now right so like it, you know the first iron man came out when i was like 17 so like i have like nostalgia with these films and so there's a part of me that's always going to be connected and in in the same way that i'm kind of always into star wars even if it fucking tortures me i'll still go see the next movie um uh but yeah it, it definitely feels like there's just a little hinge of worry of like man i hope I hope they can keep it up. Uh, I, and, yeah. and honestly, it's just too of like, they're doing so much now simultaneously than they were before. And it's that cert- other worry of like, well, Kevin Feige was so heavily involved in everything before. So much is going on now that he can't surely be involved at that level in everything. Surely. And so he's having to delegate and, you know, hopefully he finds people that share his vision and can, can accomplish it. But there. There, there has to be at least some point some quality drop off 
just in putting things in new people's hands and having to get them used to it and figure out how to take it to where it needs to go next. So hopefully that's just a dip. No, I agree. And it goes back up. But. I mean, when you have so many like new writers tackling so many yeah. episodes of television, it's just like it's the the mathematics, it will it kind of shows itself. I um I want to ask like I want to get into the post credit scene in a second. Sure. Um do you have a favorite eternal? And if if so, do you which one would you like to see again in the MCU? Uh, Not, I was, don't count Dane Whitman. No. I would say Kingo, just because I thought Kamal Nanjiani was I love him as an actor and just as like a as an artist, creator, whatever. And I think um he was really fun and felt also a bit more distinct than the other characters. Like some of like like even like uh Jimmy Chan. I'm probably Prince pronouncing that again. I apologize. Um, she just felt like kind of like prototypical female protagonist superhero lady. You know what I mean? Like, I don't feel like she didn't feel distinct. You know what I mean? And even like uh, Brian Tyree Henry's Fastos. I love him as an actor, but I felt like he was the same character he is in everything, just in an MCU movie. You know what I mean? Like, I did not feel like he felt distinct to me. Like, I even felt like at times I feel like I'm, he delivered this line the same way in Atlanta as like a hip hop sure. artist in the, in the hood that he is as an MCU superhero. And I'm not saying that's on him. That maybe just be a direction thing or like, that's what they wanted from him. But to me, Kumail actually felt more just fun for one. He was fun. He was more fun than any of the other characters to me. He had, he was kind of the comedic, comedic relief character for sure. And his, um, his little hinge sidekick, uh, Karun was, was really funny and fun. And kind of it's oh, becoming that kind of like stereotypical like Marvel comedic relief character. I feel like him and um, the it, the Shang Chi movie. What's his name? The the white guy that was the fake Mandarin kind of had the oh, same Steve roles Trevor. in different or movies. Trevor Slattery. Yeah. Yes, Trevor Slattery. They had the same like roles of like being this like comedy oh, yeah, man along definitely. for the ride with this kind of commentary, and they were funny. Uh, but yeah, I, I I love Camille. I love Kingo, and and this is another slide to the movie. He drops out before the last act. He just leaves. And he's like, Yeah, it's I, I, can't, weird. I can't fight you, but I can't fight him, even though he's going to kill you if I don't, <laughs> which doesn't make sense uh, to me. But, um, and then, it, and like, it felt like so primed for that, like, oh no, everything's going wrong. And here comes Camille with his finger guns to save the day. And then it just never happened. And it felt like just like a, a total, like, miss of an opportunity there. Um, but yeah, that was my favorite. What about you? Well, you know, I, I think, I, hey, I love him. He's great. I think it is super weird that he is not in the final battle. I won't lie to you. I didn't notice it until I went home. And I started reading online. I didn't notice that he wasn't there. Even though he's, even though he says it, I must have checked out or something during that sure. moment and, like, just didn't notice him not in the final battle. Sure. Um, I, I think I do love him. I, I like his finger guns. It's a really cool thing. It just looks fun. And I he love looks his hilarious doing it. Oh, yeah, he does. And I'm glad I like him as an actor. I really I used to watch him a lot in Silicon Valley, which I it's a show I loved. And um, but for me, I really liked Gilgamesh a lot. Like I just like the way he like bitch slapped some sure, deviants. Like, just, like, like, man, he's cool. And of course they end up killing him, which I was really upset about. I do like Thena a lot. I think she I love Angelina Jolie in general, and she just she She's looks great. just so pretty. She has a great power set. She's like cool and intimidating and she has like a personality to her. And let me just, I want to put it aside here that I don't think I mentioned it. Um, Gilgamesh and, and Thena best, best relationship on screen. We, I was more connected with Definitely. them than anyone else. And like her whole plot of yep. like going insane. Love it. So good. It yep. was like a superhero gets dementia basically. And like them dealing with that. And that was, that was great. But honestly, the more of the movie should have been about that because that that felt real and like I connected with that super hard. No, you're right. I think it's great. Um, and I'll say this: like, I wasn't a huge fan of Sprite like in the trailers, but I didn't mind her so much in the movie. I was like, okay, I don't mind, I don't hate you or anything. Um, but I will say this: um, I think the I can't think of her name. She was um, she's she speaks sign language. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Uh -huh. I can't think of her name right now. It's yeah, but she, 
the way her powers, I, mean, I want to say her name because I don't want to give her some credit. It was Lauren, Macari, Lauren, yeah. Lauren, Lauren Ridloff. Ridloff. Ridloff, yeah. Yeah, Ridloff. I love her power. Like the way her powers are presented visually, I thought were mm. amazing. Yeah. And like to me, like that is how I want to see the flash in a movie. Like that is like one of, if not the best interpretation of like going super fast in movie history, in my opinion. Like I good. love how I it agree. looked. Like, like I like there's that school of thought where you do like the Quicksilver and X-Men, where it's like everything's slow motion, which is super fun and cool looking. But the opposite is where she looks like she's going still, but everything else is going super fast around her. Sure. And I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's like literally the opposite version of it, which but it still is the same thing. Yeah, no, it, it was it was really cool. I liked her a lot. I liked those scenes. Yeah, and you and definitely you got some. I mean, she even said like Man of Steel was a huge inspiration for her. Clearly, clearly with Icarus and some of his shots, but even with her, she feels like a Dragon Ball Z character, the way she's going so fast. It's yes. awesome. No, she was great. And, and she just <laughs> what's what's another <laughs> I keep getting these ideas and like, oh yeah, and I'm like, oh, this is actually a bad thing for the movie. I felt more connected with her than a lot of characters that had lines. <laughs> you know? How do you feel about uh, Druid? Druig, you mean? Um Is it Druig? It's oh, Druig, it Druig with a G. Okay. Yeah, it's weird. Um, yep, you're right, you're he right. was interesting, but they didn't do enough with him is how I felt. Like, I wish that we had, like, I wish he had been kind of like more weird. Like, I think it's kind of creepy having this guy that could, like can just mind control masses amounts of people. I almost wish they had gone like more dark with that to make him just more interesting. Cause he, he kind of feels like this dark, weird brooding character that might not always do the right thing kind of thing, uh, is kind of willing to do yeah. whatever he wants not as much worried about what what impact that has on the people like i'm like do these people like are they cool with being mind control do they know it's happening are they just happy this way like i don't know um yeah. but they just didn't do enough with him and that was kind of the problem with most of these characters is like oh that's an interesting idea but you just don't go deep enough for it to be flushed out to feel like to give me enough to hold on to to like it is it it is interesting you're right it is interesting that he's like painted as like doing a bad thing which i think he is obviously he's like no better than a celestial at that point and then at the end they're like everyone's okay with it like he's it seems like one of the things they're trying to say in the movie thematically is like all these characters are really flawed even icarus even spry even druig but they've all been around so long together like these range of emotions are just yeah. normal and it's like it's almost like you can't escape your family. So like they've accepted sure. every flaw possible. And, but like, yeah. it doesn't come across successfully. Does that make sense? No, I agree. And I think that leads to me to another problem with it is I feel like none of these characters like learn anything through this movie that helps them accomplish their goals, right? All they're learning is more information. Who is actually the bad guy? Like that's the only like piece of information that kind of changes what they're doing, but there's no like moment where they like doubt themselves Kind of, well, I guess there's that kind of moment with with Cersei at the end when she's trying to like, what or she's trying to change the celestial into stone or whatever, but it just but that happens like at like the crux, like that's like at literally the climax of the movie. That's the first moment she like doubts herself and then kind of still is able to do it. We don't get this like moment where the characters are like doubting everything they believed in and they have to overcome the self doubt or whatever in order to like accomplish their goals. And I feel like yeah. that just, that kind of speaks to that of like, I don't know, I can't, sorry, I kind of lost, you, 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 I lost my thought there. No, no, well, well, I mean, no, I was just saying like, basically what it boils down to is that, you know, they're all doing these horrible or the yes. bad things, but it feels like, like, like example, Sprite stabs Cersei and it feels like, you know what? I think Sprite probably stabbed Cersei like four times in their whole 5,000 year existence and right. you're, you're right like, it is like the perfect free screen for you right now <laughs> it's oh, just like the ultimate like oh wait this my is like, connection yeah. is unstable um, but it feels like message. yeah it feels like sprite has done this multiple times or they all have in some way to each other but it's so like commonplace for them that they can forgive them the next day which makes things which makes everyone's actions almost pointless because oh yes you kill you stab yes. me next tomorrow i don't care because we've been friends for five thousand years which and like, makes oh, them you feel had a not bad real yesterday. characters because it's like yeah. they're not actually dealing with the things that are happening now, does igoras die i can't even remember 
we don't actually see him die. Like it's implied heavily what, that he what, dies. What did he? What happened to him? I can't. I'm just like, what even fucking happened to that guy? Are you making a joke? He yeah. flies no. into the sun. Oh fuck! Oh my god, you're <laughs> right. Oh no. <laughs> that's why i couldn't remember because i literally blocked it out of my brain because it was so got me it gave me all the yeah. wrong cringy feelings of like oh my yeah. god and like what's worse is they like tried to play i guess they were trying to be clever with me like oh yeah that whole icarus flying too close to the sun is just a story sprite told one time it just oh my god it felt so bad when he did that it felt so cringy it felt so like yeah it's bad how do we even know this this is gonna kill an eternal because they seem pretty like tough i I don't know like it just it just was bad maybe it it does really really bad i could i could see a world where right before he hits the sun fully like air stops him and is kind of like of course hey you actually follow my beliefs well just even at a base level like is Marvel really going to kill Richard Madden that quickly when they just got him in and he's like this like hunk of all hunks? I doubt it. Um, Maybe not. I don't well, know. Yeah, that I, was a you know, I, moment. I, Thanks for reminding me. It <laughs> the, was. The, the, the one more You're sour welcome. moment. Well, like, here's a weird thing, too. And, and like, I'm fixing to move on because we're, we're, we're running long here, which I'm not super against. But one of the things that uh, is interesting is like, sprite comes up and stabs cersei right like it's a pretty it looks at least compared to our standards a pretty serious wound druid comes up and bashes her in the head and then he's like hey this is your fight now i can't put him to sleep like for no reason like his the whole plan is to put him to sleep and he's like no yeah. this is your fight now you're the one you're the chosen and it's like okay well, i guess we're just going to change plans right now and then she puts right. him to sleep x y and z but Sprite, well, here's what's interesting is that I guess since Sprite got bashed into the head, she's like, all right, I just, I'm, I'll help with the Unimind. Like, there, she doesn't have Oh, my no God, the Unimind. Like, the Unimind was bad. Sorry, you go ahead. Finish your thought. Just reminding me of what well, I'm bad saying. Thing. Like, she she just like, all right, I'll help out. And then Icarus is like, okay, I'll help out. And actually, here's the thing. Maybe Arishem won't save him because he does actually stop. He actually helps the Unimind. So maybe he does die. I don't know. I don't know, man. It's The Unimind. That was another, like... And just like as a filmmaker, like these moments bother me when they're like trying to figure out how to build it. And he's like, we don't have everything we need. And then like some bat, I can't remember what happened. Something happens. And then he runs and he's like, I figured it out. We have everything we need. And it was just like, I was just like, no, like that's just so bad. Like that's just like, like I get it. And I get like when you're trying to figure out a scene, you're like, okay, well they need to come into a conflict here because they need to have a conflict. Like they can't build a Unimind. And then this is going to happen. And then they need to figure out how to resolve it. But it just feels like so like, oh, well, they'll just figure it out. <laughs> they just He just figures it out because he's smart. But there's no reason why he figures it out. We're not even told how he figures it out. He just figures it out. And it's just like, that well, is just an example of just poor storytelling. It's just like, no, that's not good enough for me in a, in a big movie like this. That's not good enough writing. You know, here, here's a great little comparison. I think you're hundred percent right, but here's the comparison in end game. Tony figures out time travel because he figures out time travel, but I think it's okay because we've, we've shown, we've seen throughout 10 years that Tony kind of just is super smart and he can do, do this kind of stuff randomly. And also we care about his character. That's the yes. big thing. Well, and it's also like, it feels like he's given new, like, cause it does. I, I Maybe I'm misremembering or misreading those scenes. When Scott and all of them come to him and they're like, we were thinking about doing this because I was just stuck in the quantum universe for five, like for five minutes, but it was five years. It feels like he's been given new information to deal with, to try and that's figure true. this out. You're right. It feels like, oh, well, oh, that's interesting. He was able to do that. That's And at first he's like, oh, it was just, it was random chance that you were able to do that. But then investigating, he's like, wait a minute. I figured it out now right. because you brought this right. new information to me. Now I've come up with this new, and that feels good because that feels like you're right. Tony is a genius and we expect him to figure these things out, but it's not like he was just like not working on it and then decided to give it two seconds of thought and figured it out. Right. It felt like something had to happen for him to be able to figure it out. And the movie. You're right. Justify that with the plot. (laughs) That's a satisfying way to do it because here's the thing. It's like, it would have been one thing if they're like, we don't, we can't figure out the, the, the mega mind, whatever the fuck. And then like, the problem is what happens in between him not figuring it out and figuring it out has nothing to do with the Megamind. It's this random other character moment. If it had been like, oh, 
I had this moment, but then it made me think, oh, but what if we do this? It wasn't that. It was like, Fastos can't figure it out. Let's go check in with Cersei dealing with something completely irrelevant to this to this problem. Then he comes in, I figured it out. You know, like that's like just, right. that's just bad. To me, that's bad writing. To me, that's like, if we're doing that, then we need to go back to the drawing board because obviously like what we're working with here isn't strong enough to stand on its own and we're having to like supplement it with poor narrative. I agree. Poor narrative you. logic. You're making me not like this movie as much, Daniel. I kind of not liking it. Um, <laughs> so let's get into the, we're, this is like one of our better reviews because we're actually tearing it down. What's a, what's a, Shredding. let's talk about the post credit scene. My, my favorite okay. part of the movie, which is this last minute of the, after the credits. And yeah. I told you and Travis both, I said, the thing I'm looking forward to the most is Dane Whitman's character because I wanted to see him wield the ebony blade, which we got a name drop earlier. And we also yeah, got a reference like to that. vampires by Klingo. Klingo, Kingo. That's right. Yeah. And essentially the scene is, okay, Cersei's gone. He kind of, alludes to earlier he has some family history which i'm not sure if it, it seems kind of weird like that is a little weird he's like asking her about being a, a uh, eternal but then he's also got a secret past yeah and that right. feels a little weird but let's ignore that for a second so he has the ebony blade he feels like i gotta touch this thing to wield it to get its power to bring her back and if you know the history of the ebony blade if you it basically it's passed down from generation to generation and if you wield it it's like from a bloodline kind of thing you wield it it curses you and it makes you super violent the more blood it gets on it and so you basically go crazy love it love which, it which ar- earlier you mentioned like how he's such a good like almost captain america like um purity exactly. it's perfect because you can see already like that's more interesting than every eternal combined is that he's this guy and he's going to be tortured over the next 10 years in the MCU yeah i mean no, hundred percent. I I feel like he his battle with that curse also feels like it might be pivotal to like the finale. Like that might be integrated into like the final boss battle of this phase or of this of, you know of the yeah. of this saga. Yeah, I agree because it it really does. It takes that cap character and gives him like a debilitating negative basically to his powers, yeah. and I think that's interesting. No, I agree. I loved it. I well, thought, and of course the the off screen line. Which, you know, you had to tell me in the theater. And I was like, oh, my God, it is that. That was so exciting. Yeah. Well, real quick, the the inscription on the whatever is holding the sword mm. is death is my reward. So it really feels yeah. like it's like, OK, this man probably won't make it out of the big. No. Event. And that's fine. Yeah, I mean, that's great. It is, you got to kill your fine, darling. You got to kill fine. your darlings. You got to be able to kill your darlings to make good. Good. Stories. Yes, you do, Mr. Gunter. And. Of course, we were treated. I didn't know this till I got home that night because, like, no one knew. Like, I was yeah. on message, board, message boards and everything. Right. It's Blade. It's Mah- Mahersha Ali is Blade. Yes. It's his first credit as Blade ever. Yeah. On screen, baby. And what's cool about this, and I mentioned this to you, Daniel, but for our listeners, is that the Ebony Blade has ties to fighting Dracula. So mm. there is a group, I can't think of their name, but there is a group in the MCU that sometimes combine, like, Blade, Ghost Rider, um, freaking mm-hmm. Dane Whitman, mm-hmm. the Black the Black Knight, and these guys can come together. Maybe not Ghost Rider, but they can come together and they can fight Dracula in Blade's solo movie. That is the plot of the movie now. I'm convinced, and it's uh, an amazing sounding movie to me. Slightly a side thought: Do you think Morbius makes it into the Blade solo movie? Because I remember in the in the animated Spider Man, Morbius Ooh. and Blade had a lot of back and forth. Like they Definitely. had a lot of lot of integrated uh, and- plots. I don't know if Marvel. I feel like. I feel like Tom will play with Sony. I don't feel like yeah. Sony will play with the MCU. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we'll see. I guess. I guess we don't know yet. And then by the, as, 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 we just don't know how it's going to work yet. Feige did say, like in a quote, like there's not going to be. He like basically was like, it's kind of a bold claim. He said there's not going to be any more issues with Sony and Marvel in terms of in- yeah. interconnectivity. Or sharing stuff, which or whatever. makes me nervous. But I hope that they know what they're doing. <laughs> it makes me very nervous. It, which it makes actually, me nervous the Morbius it feels trailer like, doesn't look that bad. No, it doesn't. It looks pretty decent. Um, and I like Jared Leto. He's a great actor. He does some I do too. all his not all his roles. He does are great, but he's a good actor. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, I know. I I'm like once you told me that that was Blade, and that was for one, it was like of course that's Mahershala Ali's voice. It like made, it was like total connection. Yeah, that's exactly what he sounds like. Um, 
Yeah. But for two, it's just like, like that was another announcement when they made that a few years ago that was like, holy shit, Blade. Like that was their like one more thing at one of those events of like, oh yeah, yeah one more thing. We're bringing Blade back and Mahershala walks on stage with like glasses on. He just looked great. Um, no, I mean, I mean like that to me, I, I would love it now if we get Dane Whitman and Blade like kind of being in each other's movies potentially. Like, I don't know. I guess we're getting a Blade 100%. movie before we're getting another Black Knight thing, I would assume. Uh, but to me, it's like, oh, well, I was going to ask you, does Blade ever wield the Ebony Blade? I, I don't know, honestly. Yeah, I, wa- I was almost wondering, I was like, what if he borrows it for his movie? <laughs> or something like that. Potentially. <clears throat> I just think that it's um, it's such a good setup for for Dane Whitman's character right. to be in that universe and to also bring us into like the dark Marvel part, of like the sorcery, the vampires, yes. the ghost riders of the universe. Yes. Which also, I'm very excited for that. Real quick. Did you watch the She-Hulk or Moon Knight trailers or Captain Marvel trailers? I haven't seen any of them. Oh, you need to watch this. I do. I didn't even. Moon Knight I think I is knew particularly that, interesting. I, I didn't. I don't think I realized that they were like actual teasers. I thought they were like production teasers. Like one of those are like, oh, here's behind the scenes shots. And we'll show you one image from like the actual scene we're shooting. I, I didn't realize they were actual. Oh, no, there's actually like, yeah, there are 30 second teasers. like a oh, footage. Cool. Cool. No, I need to check that out. Okay. Well, well, we'll talk about that next time. But obviously, it sounds like obviously, but we're, you know, I still enjoyed the movie, the experience. It raises a lot of questions, especially when we start getting the high level sci fi. I enjoyed it. I want to see Dane Whitman, of course. I want to see Blade. I wouldn't mind seeing a few of these turtles pop up later and something down the road. Sure. We'll see what happens. I don't expect an Eternals 2 anytime soon. I expect maybe some other ensemble movie that they're in. I honestly just hope we don't get an. I don't think we need another standalone Eternals movie. I think you just divvy up these characters where they fit in best with other teams. Like Kamal Nanjiani hanging out with the Guardians, that feels like would be great. They would fit together great. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't yeah. know. I, I just feel like I don't. I don't have any desire to see all these characters in a movie by themselves again. At this point, question: Do you think they can resolve some of these plot points they've said? Like they've they ended on a cliffhanger. They're pretty confident. It seems like they were going to have a Eternals two. Do you think we're going to get an Eternals 2? No, because we... to me, that cliffhanger felt like it's more setting up an Avengers level threat, not an Eternals 2. That's that's kind of what I was saying before. It's like, I don't I don't read that as, oh, this is what they'll be dealing with. I read this as like, this is a moment where we battle planet something or something like that, where we bring a bunch hmm. of people in and that's when that's dealt with. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's talk about Probably the the most honestly, this trailer is more exciting than all of the Eternals. Spider Man <laughs> No Way Home trailer. Yeah, let's react to that. Let's real talk quick. about this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this won't take too it long. Drops last okay. night. Oh no no no, two nights ago. Two nights ago. So this trailer, mm. it told told us a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Essentially, obviously, spell goes wrong. We know that villains come into the universe. Yes. Um, they capture them at least partly. And then to- um, Spidey decides to try to save them because he is told that they are going- all going to die in his universe, which I will push back because Lizard and Salmon don't die in their respective movies. So I'm, so no. I'm a little confused by that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've just seen a lot of people talking about that. And of course, yeah. And there's a lot of, a lot of cool things in this. We obviously get the, which I mentioned beforehand, I want to see them fight at the Statue of Liberty, which we're getting. Yep. Yep. With that now has a Captain America and, shield on it, which is cool. Which which is cool, but I'm also kind of like, that's kind of weird. Sure. I think it's more weird than cool, actually. Okay. Do you have a cat? Do you have a cat visitor? Yeah. I just heard him like mew very lightly. I think he's going into the Yeah, I heard him too. Um, and I mean, we're getting to see a lot of cool things. We get to see more Doc Ock. We see Green Goblin for the first time. We see Electro on his badass mask. We see Lizard. We see Sandman. And what's also cool is it looks like Doc Ock acquires the Iron Spider suit and it becomes part of his armor. Oh, I didn't notice that. You didn't see that? No. Well, after he hits him, you just shot with his like his uh, claws, and the the red spider armor is attaching to his claws. So oh. it looks like he's getting an upgrade. Some say is that, that maybe pop- that cures him, and basically, oh, I, I have him. heard that. I have heard that. And he beca- like and it, it fixes the inhibitor chip, and that's why he has that conversation in the hey, like we all go to our deaths. I can and see that. Then, and like, honestly, he's not, 
we don't see him in the final battle in the trailer. Well, and as a character, like he, his problem was like those machines like took over him and like made him crazy. Like the technology broke yeah. and it broke him. He wasn't like an evil character ever. It wasn't like he uh, ever had bad. He always had great intentions and was like a good person. And then the technology broke, and that's what caused him to go insane, basically. So I think that works really well if they want to do that. And I'm I would like that. I think for one, I just think Alfred Alfred Molina is just. You couldn't cast a better Doc Ock, in my opinion. Like, you just couldn't. And I just right. want him more on screen. And to have him in more of, like, a anti-hero, if at the, at the very least, role, I'm super into. Well, here's what's interesting is, like, so far we have five villains, five villains confirmed, at least according mm-hmm. to this trailer. And... It's like, okay, and also let's talk about the Brazil thing. It's guaranteed almost that the, spy, the other two Spider-Men are in this movie. The leaks matched up with the the, the uh, trailer in terms of the, the scaffolding, and even the lizard gets kicked by an invisible something in the Brazilian trailer, which was in a second longer in a particular shot, showing that, hey, there's something there that's not Tom Holland Spider-Man, so it has to be one of the other two Spider-Men, right? Like, we, if you're not convinced yet, yes. you, Daniel, or the rest of the world, there's too much fucking evidence. No, I'm convinced. I saw... So, I, think I, I texted this last night, so I, I am convinced now. I did watch that Brazilian shot, and it's very yes. evident that, that something punches him. And if you just look at that shot that they do show in the trailer, and Spidey's yeah, like... It's, it's missing. It's yeah. just, there's a bunch of negative space that no one would have in a in this film basically from a cinematography right. perspective like there's just this empty space down here like in the bottom left and like half of the left screen that's just like no one composes a shot like that ever there's no reason unless you, yeah. like, that there's going to be more people and more things happening there that aren't in the movie 100 no 100 percent agreed and it's cool that i love the restraint also of not showing them like i i appreciate yeah. it just because I want to, I mean, I'm, I'm okay not seeing anything else until the movie comes out. I was okay no. a year ago, honestly. Yeah. 100%. But it's weird seeing that we have five villains in this movie and we're one away from the Sinister Six. It's like, why don't, like, is, is there a secret villain we don't know about? And also, is Doc Ock, is he not going to fight in the final battle against the other three Spider Men? Like, it seems to me like you want to see Doc Ock fight three Spider Men with Sandman, with Lizard, with Green Goblin, with Electro. Like yeah. that seems like amazing, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, to me, that I, that doesn't bother me as much. I guess I I just want a good movie with all of these people in it. If they can just deliver a quality narrative, character, all this kind of stuff that is like meets the expectations of what we want out of a basically a multiverse Spider-Man movie, I sure. don't care if there's five villains instead of six. To me, that doesn't really do anything. It doesn't does not move the needle either way for me. Uh, as long as they man, because that's the thing too, we're coming up, we're coming off this ensemble movie that handled the ensemble nature of it poorly, in my opinion, on Eternals. We're coming out again, another ensemble movie, but basically we've got an ensemble of villains and an ensemble of heroes. It's a lot to manage narratively. And just, I just want a good story and a good movie out of these elements. And as long as they can deliver that, if they have to slightly change some comic accurate things to make that work i'm fine i don't care um i i'm well, Daniel, on you're who a, are we missing are rhino fool. are we missing rhino i don't matter you're a fool let's just say okay. that because you okay. need the sinister six sure. trust me and like here's the thing you just they can the show vulture. up in the final battle He's like, anyway i'm like the like the the i hope they do moment. No, 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 no. Uh, they're in gonna, the movie, they're, yes, I hope they do. Here, like, no, in, in the in-game moment of this, they're going to show up, and it's going to be kind of like that Marvel shot with all the girls, but it's the Sinister Six walking up and being like, I hope let's, so. get, let's get Sinister or something stupid like that. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I hope I William Defoe says this is the Sinister Six. Like, I hope he says it. This is the Sinister Six in his William <laughs> Defoe Green Goblin voice. Does he say that in the comics? Does, he a, talk, does they call themselves that? I mean, that's the name of the group, the Sinister Six, yeah. Okay. And Doc Ock forms them. And, like, here's the thing. The Vulture is one of the Sinister Six. And it's like... Yeah. You know, it's like, here's what's weird, is that all the villains so far, all five of, or, yeah, all five of the villains are all villains from the past Spider-Man movies. He don't have any... He don't have a villain of his own that represents his bad guy yet in the trailer. You know what I'm saying? Like, For where's Spider-Man? Vulture Mysterio? 
Yeah. Right. No, yeah, they're all coming from different universes, which I guess if you're just talking about like, I get it from like a creative standpoint, like we've done those characters. <laughs> we don't need to necessarily do them again. Uh, I'd rather spend more time focusing all these other great characters that we haven't seen in 20 years. Um, yeah, and I, I am a fan of that, that in a lot of ways. What? You want to bring, like, it makes sense to easily have Vulture escape prison or whatever. It does, and but I mean, he this, puts the team. I guess to me, if it, if it takes a two hour, however long this movie is, let's say it's two and a half hours. If it takes two and a half hours to do three Spider-Men, and Doc Ock, uh, Electro, Sandman, and um, Goblin. It, it takes two and a half hours to do all of that justice. Then don't. That's that's fine. I don't. I, I, and honestly, I would, I'm more worried about managing all that in the time we have than about adding more characters into this ensemble. But you shouldn't be because you're looking at this as like it's. This is the third movie in a trilogy, or this is a—it's not that anymore. Or this is even just a movie with like we're bringing in villains we don't understand. This is now the the six part in a six Spider-Man like in three trilogies. We know sure. the Foes sure. Goblin, we know Doc Ock, we know Sandman's story, we know Lizard's story, we right. know all these guys. You're right. We don't we don't need to set them up anymore. We just need to no, set up why but, they're there and why they want to kill Spider-Man. But we might need two and a half hours to do that and set up bringing in Andrew and Garfield or Andrew and, and Toby and doing them justice, not just having them show up as cameos. Like like you like you said, you I hope they show up. I show up, they show up halfway through the movie, not at the final act. I want them to be a significant part of how they figure out number. how to deal with Yeah, it. me too. And I think I'm just like No, I just, I'm just more worried about them doing that right than I am about having another villain in there. That just like to me it's like I feel like there's worries that come before have we had do we have enough villains in here? I just feel like here's my thing. There's not gonna it don't matter if the movie is a six out of ten. I'm gonna think it's eleven out of ten because Toby's coming back, so I don't care about that. Seriously, Maybe. I don't we'll care see. about that. You're so might as right. well. You're if you right. have five if you have five villains, give me one fucking more to make the sinister six. Like we've been we've been trying to do this for fucking fifteen <laughs> years. Like sure. we've like we've been as a we've been blue balled as fans for like I don't know how many gener- like times now. Like here's the Sinister yeah. Six coming, here's the Sinister Six coming. And it's like here's the perfect opportunity to do it. And I think they I hope they will. I hope they'll pull something out and say, Hey, there's more to this than just what we showed you I so mean, far. I guess the thing is it seems like Vulture's like stuck in Mor- Morbius's Mor- Morpheus Morbius's universe. Um it also kind of feels like Venom and Vulture like flipped universes like venom came to this one and vulture went to that one um well, which makes really me think we're gonna like get a venom stinger but i don't know it they're well, it dealing like with a lot me of that like things yeah i don't know i mean it feels like i don't know the vulture thing is complicated too i wonder if he is being transferred in prison or whatever because or or whatever in Morbius because he is caught at the end of Far From Home again, you know, or far, yeah, far from no home. from No Way Home again. Sure, yeah, yeah. I could I could see that, I could see that. And also, Mysterio is out there too. How much do you think? I don't think it is, but how much do you think of this is an illusion? Like it's Mysterio. Like maybe some part of it. I think it's like probably ninety five percent real. But what's like five percent? I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't think any of it. I hope none of it is because I feel like that would be, unless Mysterio is just a main part of the movie and they're hiding that, which I don't know why they would necessarily. I don't know. I just feel like we've done that role. We've done that part. We've done the Mysterio thing. We've done the illusions thing. I feel like I want real bad guys, real people, because uh, it feels like also yeah. like the the well, because of how they did Mysterio, they did it as like this multiverse tease. Oh, the multiverse is breaking open, but it's not right. And that was smart. I like that they did that. I think it was a really good way to keep teasing it before we actually got to it and make it like when we got to that final episode of Loki, it was like mind blown Um, because we were just so ready for that moment after so many, you know, so much time. Yeah. I mean, I, I had my issues with that movie too. I I really did not like the whole, like, we're just a bunch of disgruntled Stark employees. I thought that was really boring. Um, But yeah, I I mean, I, I, I guess to me, it's like, I'm so excited for this film. I totally believe the other Spider-Men are in it. It feels like impossible that they won't be now. And I think they would have like found a way to make it more obviously clear they weren't. I don't know. They they wouldn't have just kept having the people just do these dodging questions thing because they know what that's doing to people. And they know, like Andrew Garfield is a pro 
right now at like giving this like like he's like gaslighting everyone to ask about it but he's so good at it. he's like no man i don't I, you know I mean, i'd love to be in it i'd love for someone to call you know it's just he's doing a fantastic job like like tom yeah. holland should be taking notes i mean oh no you're yeah, breaking up again yeah i mean yeah you're right i mean kevin feige he, he said manager expectations, but if he he sh- if he if they weren't in it, he should say, "Hey, look, guys, I'm going to tell you right now, they're not in the movie." Like he should yes. say that. Yes. And he didn't no. for obvious reasons because they're in the movie. Yes. So it's like it's 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 perfect. It's great. I mean, I mean, I'm going to enjoy it. Quick, um, fifty or like over or under? Do you think the hand that grabs MJ is Andrew Garfield's hand? Yes. Because not because of the shot, but because thematically his Gwen died and he could be saving yes. her and then he yes. could, another one could save Ned. Yes. It's like, it's basically then like getting to go back and finish plot points from other movies in the same way that I think when Toby, Mc, Toby McGuire shows up, they're gonna be like, what the fuck are you wearing? Get those stupid clothes off and go put on some normal fucking clothes before you come in this movie. <laughs> and they're going to just, they're going to, they're going to fix it. <laughs> they're going to fix the past. And then he's going to like do one of these and like, no, shut the fuck up. Do not ever point, do finger guns at me and try to moonwalk ever again and then and then they're going to move on and never reference that again that's that's how they're going to intro toby i like i like emo parker you you can get off that i like emo parker (laughs) the last thing i'll say about this trailer you know it looks the 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 visuals looks great i love this if here's what's cool about the most the seriousness of it it feels like these this spider movie has stakes yeah and i'm i'm still i'm very curious and slightly apprehensive about what the whole doctor because it feels like at some point he fights doctor strange but that feels like it's yeah. later. It feels like they they open up the spider, they botch the spell or whatever. Which I'm overall, I'm not a fan of how Doctor Strange seems to be portrayed in this. Like he seems like a dick. The yeah, whole he time really in does. The trailers, like, he, and maybe they're gonna like do something with that, like, and like make him go through shit in his movie to make him not a dick anymore. And I thought it's like his old, like his whole thing was like he was just like major cocky dickhead before he lost his hands. But he was never that um, in Infinity War. And I mean, he was like cocky. No, he and was arrogant in, in Infinity War. But, War. but he was totally that way in Infinity War. But he wasn't a, like he, he he was cocky because he was right, not because he, he was. He was, just being a dick. but he was also just a dick. Too. Like he could have been right and not a dick. I don't think so. I think the way no, he, he could have like, been, but the way he was, he was just he was condescending the entire time with anyone that was not. Sure, wow. condescending, but like I mean, MJ is right in the trailer. She's like, "This is your spell, dumbass." Like, why are you acting? I this agree. Way I agree. I I'm not saying he was correct. I'm just saying he does. He has been condescending in everything but in game, basically, like in in game, and that's only because all he does is point a finger. Up. That's all he does in the whole movie. <laughs> and it's kind of hard. What if he was like this? He's like he did this, and like Tony dies. He's like, oh, Mitt. <laughs> well, what if he did that? No, like Mitt. two options. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> He did this, and then Tony's like this, and he's like, like, you know, but still, fuck you, man. I fucking hate you. Uh, no, but, it's not, I you think, know, I, I did. Anyway, I, I, I feel like no, he's I mean, gonna be a dick in this movie, and they're probably gonna let that be a thing until like his movie, and he's gonna go through shit that's gonna make him less. But, but then again, it also feels like are we repeating the same plot point of like this super awesome guy that's a dick because he's so good at shit, loses everything, and then rebuilds himself in this new way, and. He's not a dick at first, but then he gets so powerful, becomes a dick again. And so he has to like be humbled again. You know what I mean? Um, well, I it's also interesting because like, what is, I mean, obviously what's he doing during the movie? Like if, and then he's like, you, you got to Scooby do this shit. It's like, yeah, like why would you, you do it? Like, is this not a big enough problem that you would want to help? <laughs> like as, as like the master of all yeah. this shit, like, isn't this like by nature of it, your responsibility just because you helped, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that. Yeah, it's. it's I could strange. see this as we're talking about it. I could see after the multiverse breaks in, he lets them all go. Obviously, he's unleashed the Sinister Six. Sorry, the Sinister Five, and then essentially, you, yeah, yeah. I rolled my um, eyes. I rolled my eyes. I know. I saw. <laughs> essentially, like maybe he's like, okay, there's some weird multiverse shit going on. I'm going to go off for a minute. You take care of this. I'll be back here in like thirty, like yeah. two days or something. There's a part of me that wonders. Does this and Multiverse of Madness have overlap chronologically? 100%. What if the movie like, ends on a cliffhanger? I think that's totally possible. 110% possible. I think this might end. He says they're all coming in. Like, who's he talking about in that moment? And like, yeah. let's the Multiverse and, and they were at the, They seem like they were at the, the Statue of Liberty at that moment. At least that's yeah, how they Yeah, and that's it. the peak maybe of they, because they, the shield they was already... The cut. 
They may because have the shield is ar- your truth. Because yeah. the shield has already fallen at the point where he's on top of the Statue of Liberty. Right. So it could wonder... it could be a fake trailer moment where they're trying to hype up the whole like, That's oh, true. but who are they coming in? It's just the Spider-Man or whatever, because they're not showing them on screen at that moment or something. I don't know. But yeah, no, it, it's interesting. I mean, I'm all in. It this movie, like how we talked about earlier, this movie feels like a a MCU level plot but we've been building to it. Like you said, this is building on the previous Spider-Man franchises and the, what we've done with, with Tom Holland in this universe. So it feels like we're ready to have a movie that basically all it does is do plot, like at the highest level of universe consequence versus the Eternals where it's like their first step is this giant big threat level thing. Um, Yeah, no, I'm in, I I can't wait. Uh, I'm honestly probably ready to just kind of go like, you know go uh blackout on all like spider-man related thing i just i just don't need to see anymore i haven't you know i, I do for think like six that, months um but yeah. this is going to be i think that the, the two spideys aren't going to come until the end because it's rumored if you watch the leaked footage andrew says you have web blood like he's talking to toby like yeah. he basically he doesn't have web shooters right, right. they're comparing I don't think their he powers. would say that i don't think he would say that if they had met in the middle of the movie because i mean or maybe that moment happens in the middle of the movie they're at but they're at the scaffolding in the leaked foot in the the leaked thing like they're at the statue of liberty in the leaked thing Uh, well i mean yeah i guess i mean i I could see them being introduced earlier but that's the time that's the first time we actually see them in action so we actually see them fighting and using web and shit that's that's true but you think that they're gonna it's possible they could be brought brought in as peter parker's yeah, and I think that I, I hope that ha- I hope we get Peter Parker's hanging out before we get Spider Man's hanging out. And to be fair, there could be a moment where, like, in the final battle, because like so far they're just shooting webs, like you don't you don't see what's under the hood, right? And he's like, he's basically like, uh, my web shooter's out, and he's like, you have web shooters, and he's like, I just use this, yeah. like it's in the yeah. final battle, yeah, like yeah, they, yeah, you know exactly. what I'm saying? It's just like a, it sounds like it might be like a small like comedic moment in the middle of a bunch of action. Yeah. Which it, that's yeah, exactly. very Marvel. That's very Marvel's style. Yeah, which I'm totally down for. All right, it's super exciting. I'm super ready for it. Me too. Daniel, how can our listeners write into us? Uh, hold on, my phone is ringing, and it's also my camera, so that's an interesting thing. You're having uh, all kinds <laughs> of issues. <laughs> I am. Yeah, I know. Pet. If my cat came and just fucking pooped. It smells like shit in here, but I'm waiting until the thing's <laughs> over to clean it up because you know I don't think I'm you want to see that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> What did you want me to do? The bitly? Is that okay? Yeah, please do okay, that. Okay, okay, I can do that. Okay. No, I can do it. I just forgot what you wanted me to do. Listeners. <laughs> uh, this has been a doozy, but it's been a great episode because I feel like we've gotten to the nitty gritty of the Eternals and of Spider-Man trailer and what we think about that sure. movie. So write into us. Let us know at bit.ly slash two for one mail. If we're just totally off the mark when it comes to Eternals, um, there's probably some plot points that I maybe missed. Now that doesn't mean the movie's better than it is. It means maybe that plot movie didn't do great with presenting the plot points. Uh, Cause I am infallible. So bit.ly slash two for one mail. Let us know what you thought of Eternals. Let us know what you think is going to happen in this new Spider-Man movie. How many, how many Spider-Man are we going to get? You know, there's a crazy version of this where fucking animated Spider-Man from Spider-Verse shows up in that final battle. I, I, and I'm not convinced that won't happen. Uh, Miles Morales basically shows up, but he's the Miles Morales from the movie and he's still animated. And we get into some like fucking, uh, uh, what was that? Old movie? Roger <laughs> Rabbit. Roger Rabbit shit, exactly. It's becoming a Roger Rabbit movie. Uh, at the very least, That'd I think it's probably wild. referenced. Um, but yeah, bit.ly slash 241 mail. And of course, if you didn't know, this is episode 96 of Podcast 241. By the time you're listening to this, listeners, we will have yeah, hit our. Give us a hand. Give us a hand. Wherever you are, stop what you're doing. Give us a hand. 96 episodes. What a what a feat. And Donovan's frozen. Your anniversary, and right now it is November 18th. So by the time you listen to this, we might have hit that. Daniel, two years ago we started this podcast, and we've almost done a yeah. hundred episodes. Yeah, I don't know. See, I'm not. Internet's being weird, and so it's like freezing and stuff. Like. You froze for a second there, and I think we missed most of that. But at the same time, I made a joke about how everyone should stop what they're doing and clap for us for getting the 96 episodes. I heard it. Oh, okay. So you were completely frozen and gone. And I think that's probably what, because my computer's doing the recording. So it probably missed most of what you said. 
But um, oh, all I said was November twenty first is our two year anniversary. This wow. is the eighteenth, so in three days we will hit two two years and almost a hundred episodes of Podcast Super One. So if you can, and and for a, a special prize, we're going to be giving away subscriptions to our YouTube channel. That's true. If you head over to youtube.com slash two for one studios, you can celebrate the two year anniversary of podcast two for one, as well as all the cool content two for one studios. Hit that subscribe button. Get it totally subscribed free. for yourself. You can totally free. Take it is. You can print off the subscribe thing and you can frame it on your wall. Yeah, you can. And then and then send us a picture of that. And that's the only way we will know you did it. We're not gonna accept and any other any other methods of validation. Us- you can send us the image you printed off, like prepaid, prepaid mail, of course. Like you have to pay for it to get their income back, and yes. we'll sign it for you. That's true. That's that's true. And someday that will be worth something. Maybe like two hundred and forty-one cents or something like Ooh, that. Ooh, or dollars. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be yeah, dollars would be great. Anyway, <laughs> my name is Donovan Thompson, and my name is Daniel Wingfield, and we have spoken.